Hello everybody, this is going to be Q-Edit Tutorial Part 17. This is going to be a very large episode about NPC opcodes. There are a ton that are dedicated to all this, so I wanted to try and shoot for as many of these as possible in one episode and try and be as thorough as possible because it is not exhaustive. There is still some more that we have not confirmed, but with all of these opcodes we know now, there is plenty for people to work with. I'm joined here with Kayak, who is going to be showcasing this test tutorial in Dolphin for me. Yeah, so basically we're just going to be covering these in a specific order. Um, and we're going to also link a couple of these in the video description because they have like upwards of 10 or even 15 parameters that you can fill out and having something to look at while we're explaining it is going to help a lot. So without further ado, uh, let's get into this quest and get started. Right off the bat, I have laid out computers to have different types of NPCs present. This first one here we will go over later, but this second computer here is going to be a specific type of NPC. This is kind of your bread and butter NPC opcode. This one is called NPC CRP ID V3. That is function 200. That NPC is how you're going to generate 90% of them. There is a certain order that some of these NPC opcodes deviate from, and it's not universal. The first four is basically going to be the position of where it is. The fifth one is the status of the NPC. If that register is zero, the NPC is alive and will follow you. If it's one, they're dead. They're laying on the floor. You can think of like Ash from battle training from offline. Anything more, you get very awkward NPCs. We're not really going to talk about those today. The next register in that is the slot number. This computer spawns an NPC in slot two, which is the yellow gem. There is a reason for this. We will go over it later. The last register is the template that the game loads from. There is a total of 64, and these are going to be all the NPCs that you know from the story, such as Ash, Kyrie, Montague, Eleanor. The number that you use will call that character's values into the NPC. If Kayak activates this computer, the first NPC in this one is going to be Sissel. And this one increments on use, so if he keeps talking to it, he will spawn separate NPCs. As you notice, each time an NPC gets spawned, it makes the screen have this black flash for a couple frames. Not all of the NPC generations do this, but most of these is going to be followed with some opcode related to fade out and fade in so that it hides this happening in the background. If you're on hardware, the system will also load while these NPCs are being called. The one thing that I want to draw attention to with this computer is when we get to Montague here, we see that he's level 43, and I want to mention this for later. There's an, NP there's an opcode we will talk about that modifies these templates. You will generally have an NPC play paired with it. Because this NPC is the yellow gem, we're going to be using NP NPC play one. Sega decided to make NPC play zero, the one for the green gem, because you can't occupy a NPC in the red slot, or it's not normal. Most quests that have NPCs, they want you to be in the red gem, otherwise there can be some problems that arise with these. This is just going to be how you spawn these NPCs. The second type of NPC that we have is a talk NPC. This NPC is generally going to be a type that is used for just literally talking to someone. These are functionally the same as the CRP NPCs, but the difference is that when there's chat boxes, the NPC will use that gem color's chat color. So if we spawn this NPC here, and we're going to have a template NPC that is Yuji Naka. And if we see here, he has a text box that is blue because he is in the blue gem. This is a set object parameter that was used to talk to him. It is just like an at chords talk, but it's one that you can replace and move around. 
Set object parameter has an extra register compared to at chords talk that is used for how high off the ground it is. It is kind of irrelevant because you can just change the Y position of it. The second register in this opcode is the one that actually has the information for this cursor. If we scroll down to 252 here, we see that there is a delete object param that has the register for deleting this target after it is spoken to. That is why we only are able to talk to Naka once here. You can respawn one in another location with a separate function. It should be noted that without the set object parameter, you actually can't interact with this NPC at all. Uh, as far as like talking to him. So you absolutely need the set object parameter to indeed talk to a NPC in this fashion if it's a CRP talk. And paired with this opcode in here when he talks is this P look at. This is just an opcode that signifies what character slot looks at another character slot when it ran. So we just had the two NPCs look at each other. That's why they moved when they were spoken to. These two NPCs is gonna be a bulk of your creation. There is a kind of a older one on this next computer that just spawns an NPC into the green slot. It is basically the exact same as CRP ID. It just doesn't have the specific slot number in it. Functionally, this is the same type of NPC as Montague. They have combat capabilities. They have normal white text boxes. Now, there are a couple unique collisions that you can use with NPCs. If we see in the floor handler here, I have a few named check NPC straggle, NPC chords call, and party chords call. Each of these have separate utility. The check NPC straggle, if you saw earlier in the video, when Kayak was walking, there was a random text box that said on the way. That's this function 101 down here using this chat bubble. He ran into the collision, but there was no NPC, so nothing else happened. If this NPC walks through the collision that is spawned by check NPC straggle, it's going to make him teleport to a location if he is not following him close enough. As you see here, he warped back into the location that was set. This is an opcode that was used in the retired hunter. If for people who have played through that, they know that Donif sometimes gets stuck and he will just magically warp to you later. This is that opcode. The NPC straggle uses a function, which is R64 in this example here. It's calling function 101 for this opcode NPC check warp. The function has a radius that checks to see if the NPC is within a radius centered around you. If the NPC is not in your radius, then he gets check warped to your destination. The next one we'll talk about is this party chords call. To the right of Kayak, there is a switch here. If Kayak steps on this switch by himself, nothing's gonna happen. No sound plays, the switch doesn't activate, whatever. This is a script collision that checks for multiple players. Similar to an at chords call, you have to walk into it, but this has a secondary radius similar to the NPC straggle one, where if someone is in a radius inside of that radius, then it will activate. If Kayak moves a tiny bit more and gets one of these NPCs onto the switch with him, the switch will activate and it will play a sound. The NPC chords call is one that specifically is only when an NPC enters in. Now, I have one here next to this computer that he's looking at that's on the backside. If an NPC walks towards this computer, it's going to create a cutscene, which is function 102 here. This has a couple opcodes that are kind of important to talk about. The talk NPCs had NPC stop. The NPC stop is so that when Kayak walks into the script collision, it's going to make the NPC disappear from the party play. When that happens, it's going to run this opcode player walk. This one has a destination and a player slot. For some reason, you have to have the player slot twice. That's why there's 63, 64, both equaling two. When he walks there, the NPC will disappear from his party. It will then walk to the location, wait a couple seconds, which is the call 172s, and then it will use an opcode that is use animation. The first one in that opcode is the player slot number, and the second is the actual animation value. 
the animation for four in this case is going to be attack. So after Montague stops, he is going to do an attack animation. Once the animation is played out, the stop animation occurs and he will be in a default state again. And then NPC play activates and then Montague will rejoin the party. This script collision happens indefinitely though. So unless you have a set jump by. He made this so that we can infinitely activate this small little action that Montag does. So if I walk back here, you'll see Montag, he just walked there on his own. He shot the computer. Oh, he's stuck. <laughs> and if you're wondering about the animations and how many there are, we have a video that displays all of them. And I'll link it in the video description. Yeah, he's going to do that indefinitely because of its location. Yeah, he's just stuck. So he can activate his own cutscene. That's kind of funny. So yeah, because of where this is located, it's detecting him in there. So it's just going to basically infinitely loop him sh trying to shoot this console. Um... What I would say is that, you know, these collisions that you create, they don't have any uh, indication on the map or to the player that they're there. So if for some reason you wanted to add a visual effect, you would just add a simple particle and then you'd have the particle disappear and you'd also have a jump by at the beginning of the function to jump out of it so it doesn't activate a second or third time. So while this is happening, as we see here, we have three separate NPCs with us. There is a computer that's on the left here that has a kill switch. This computer will just immediately run NPC kill, which is used to completely remove an NPC from the game. As you can tell, stop just removes them from their status. But if he hits this computer, it will remove all three NPCs from the map. So now we're back to a blank slate. There's no NPCs. This next NPC that we're going to talk about, this is a special type of NPC that has a radius of spawning. If you have played the quest Grand Squall, you will have seen this before, where you walk in the forest and an NPC just shows up. There is a radius that is attached to this NPC. And if you walk in, it spawns it. And this NPC in particular is just a Bernie that is in the dead state. So the register that determines whether he's alive or dead, he is dead. This is the state where they're just kneeled over. They don't move, they don't perform anything, they're just laying on the floor. This one's also paired with a set object parameter as well. So he has a delete object parameter here, so I can only do this once. But if we, if we were to like remove this line, then I could just indefinitely activate this text box. And then if Kayak walks away from this, the NPC will disappear. It has a pretty large radius, but you will see on his map, you can also confirm on your word select list if an NPC is present on the map. It will also spawn back again if he walks back within radius. So it is a very unique and useful NPC for either a narrative or for short-term events. The next NPC, there's a lot to unpack with this one. This computer that's to the left of this door here, this one spawns a unique NPC that has its own set of data for it. If we see in function 350 here, there is a opcode labeled get NPC data. This opcode has a secondary window that if you open it, you can actually adjust what the NPC will look like. For this example, we have made it to be me, my Fomar Armand. He has all the proper proportions. You can adjust pretty much anything you could in the character creation and dressing room. This opcode has to be run with load and get NPC data together. You load those before you do the NPC opcode, and then that way the next NPC that spawns gets that information. If you also notice, there is NPC param v3 above this. This is one of those really big and highly 
adjustable op codes. If we pull up the window, I have it open here for us. Uh, these are pretty much all of the known parameters that you can enter with this op code. Obviously, as you can see, the 5th and 14th, we currently don't know. Otherwise, uh, they've been kind of unknown for quite a while, and some of these are really difficult to find. But with all the things that you have here, you could pretty much alter the NPC in a way that you would want. The values for these registers, you can do too much with these things. Example is that this template that this opcode is using is running off of Montague's template. It's template 17. As I had mentioned earlier, this Montague template is not the same level because I changed R41 in this example to 26. That's the level added to the NPC, base one. So he did 26 here? Each difficulty climbs a level by 50. So if we were to spawn this Armand in hard mode, for example, he would be level 77. Yes. Uh, you cannot have a NPC that is level 200. It hard caps at 199. Yep. I also modified his ranges of attack, his monster aggro, and how fast he can actually attack as well. They used a lot of standard values for most of these, but a couple deviations were in like attack ranges, aggro ranges, and frequencies. Um, as many of you may have seen playing like The Lost Bride, Sissel can attack with a wand at like Partisan range, for example. You can adjust how far an NPC actually attacks. Although Armand here is using a bringer's rifle, I could make him use a melee weapon and have him with rifle range. It seems pretty broken, but NPCs don't have the best AI either. We'll uh, drag our man here to go fight some Marilta's. I have them just to showcase a couple different behaviors that the NPCs can have. If you notice in the opcode as well, there is an NPC text. Um, NPCs will say lines uh, depending on the criteria for them. There is over 15 that you can do, and each of them are very specific. So here is all of the known uh, ways to trigger all the texts that you have in the uh, NPC text opcode. Obviously there's a few unknown ones here, and I'm sure they'll get found over time. But with these, if you have them all filled out, they all have the chance to activate. But if you do fill out all of these, he will say stuff really often. Like, he'll almost be spamming stuff depending, you know, what's going on in the quest. If you have none of them filled out, then he won't really say much at all during the entire quest unless you have a cutscene with him. And in those cases, you would be using two NPC opcodes. Um, one of them is NPC no talk. Um, the old version of it is called NPC non-T. All NPC non-T is, is just it stops NPC texts from appearing. You usually use those for cutscenes, and then when you're all done, you would use NPC talk. That one reactivates the NPC texts so that they can play again. So once again, we'll have Armand attack some Marilta's here. He will probably say a couple lines. He clearly has some pretty good equipment. You can uh, run an op code that equips an item to a player slot. Well, the first register for this is the slot number. Uh, he's in the yellow slot. Three registers that come after the slot number are the item's full hex. This one is aura field. This one, and then the second one, one is a tripolic shield. Is a tripolic shield. You can see him equipping it here. Um, just note that we can use these. Uh, you can actually force the NPC to equip something that they normally wouldn't be allowed to equip by the normal game's rules and confines. So you could make a Fomar, Armand here, equip like a Zonda. With this method, you can also force them to equip a single slot unit. You can't have them equip more than one slot unit at a time, and you can also use this method to also force them to equip a mag. The mags that you make 
through this opcode are level zero. So you can't really make them equip a mag that has stats on it. This equip item actually works for player characters as well. So if you ran this for my slot, you can actually force me to equip something that I normally wouldn't be able to equip, such as like a frozen shooter or a Baran's launcher or even a bringer's rifle here, or even the aura field. It works that way, but if you were to go and unequip it, let's say, you would not be able to re-equip it. Uh, what this also does is it creates the item in the inventory as well. It's a two-in-one opcode. So it creates the item in your inventory and it forces the player to automatically equip it. And not shown, but there is also an unequip item for more cutscene related purposes. All that one checks for is slot of the item that you're removing. So zero would be like a weapon, one would be armor, etc. Unequip item unfortunately does not let you unequip a specific piece of equipment like we have the wiki page filled out for that. So there's one more NPC that we can talk about. This is a NPC PK. This is one that's used for fights and combat. There is a lot of associated opcodes that are with this kind of NPC. First of all, it uses its own unique opcode, but there is a lot of additional stuff that you have to work with when you play with them. If we were to spawn this NPC right now, just with the opcode, it would be able to fight us, but we would not be able to fight back. You need to also include the opcode player PK on, which is right below it. Without that, the NPC would just bag on you the whole time and you wouldn't be able to do anything. On top of having this NPC, there is a various amount of opcodes that was uh, paired with it. The first one that I want to bring up is the PHP stat. That is an opcode where it runs an HP check for you during this. I threaded it. What this checks is for your total HP value while it runs. The opcode is not very straightforward. The input is the... The input value is your division of total HP. And the second register is going to be the player slot. This first line, it checks for your HP, and it specifically checks for when you have 25% of your HP left. If Kayak was to fall down to 25% HP, which is yellow, it would then run function 403 which says Hopkins wins the fight. It will then run of the, all the appropriate stuff. The second one is checking for if Hopkins ever falls below 33%. Obviously, this Hopkins is in normal mode, so Kayak could attack him unarmed and he would still die. So as we have killed Hopkins, it runs the chat bubble, it turns off the player PK so that other players and NPCs will stop fighting. Then it kills the NPC so he's no longer in the game. And then, just for a reference, we included a POS pipe V3. All this does is it spawns a telepipe at the destination coordinates using a player slot. This pipe is fully functional, it's just like the ones in the offline quests where you would go back to town. I included this just for clarity, there is no Pioneer 2 in this tutorial. If Kayak talks to this computer again, another thing that you may notice is that this door locks behind him. Right, so uh, when we talked to that, there's an opcode called Master Key, and Sega used this uh, opcode, Master Key on. Basically, Sega used this opcode to lock every single door on the floor. Um, it does not, however, lock these laser fences. They are treated differently. Holy crap, I'm trapped. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's something to note that if you're using a lot of laser fences for whatever reason... You would have to manually lock fences with lock 
door two and use unlock door two. Master key also works on negative one switch IDs. So this permanently unlocked door does lock with master key on. And when you do defeat him, it does call 407, which is master key off, which basically just returns all the doors to the state that they were in, whether they were unlocked or locked. Alongside this NPC, I have also included a use of set slot opcodes in here. This one specifically makes it so that you could become invincible. If Kayak once again gets beat up by this Hopkins, he will have a quest board item that will allow him to completely negate his attacks. So this Hopkins will now no longer be able to attack him as long as the register 217 is set to 1. As you will notice, when Hopkins is done fighting, it does the clear so that the invincibility turns itself off. Um, the set thought invincible is what Sega used in Phantasma World 3 and 4 for the blessing. They made it operate a bit different in those where in PW4 you would interact with something on the field to get invincibility versus just hitting a button in your quest board. Uh, PW3 used set pallet X, which we went over in an earlier episode, but same idea. It just sets you invincible for a set period of time, uh, whereas this one is just infinite because it just infinitely loops. And obviously, the particles that Sega used are also not, uh, you know, they're not included in the set slot invincible. Those are something in addition that you have to add if you want to display that quote-unquote blessing effect. This pipe stacked on itself. I did not know that was possible. The last opcode to really mention in this is the NPC action strings. They are the specific lines that Hopkins says. If my NPC texts were on a different NPC than the yellow gem, Hopkins is also the yellow gem, so they would share the same NPC texts. But the NPC action strings can be used to set NPC-specific dialogue that occurs only for that slot. So you could have very customized NPCs using all of these uh, version 3 opcodes to be able to have NPC banter, NPC cutscenes, and even have NPCs fight each other. When an NPC is set to do PK, it only will attack the red gem slot. I'll be coming into this quest in a moment to showcase it, but NPCs will only fight the red gem player. In the case of, like, my quest, Memory of the Hero, I had to specifically script Lutz to fight back the NPC that fights you. So we're in here now with two players. Uh, NPC opcodes really should not get used with multiple players because it creates a bunch of problems. There's a lot of inaccuracies with things that are done. The NPC will also only follow the first player. Follow this NPC all. in particular is also armand on my screen because the NPC opcode is being run on my client and not Kayak's. Uh, load data is client side, but NPC CRP ID is game wide. So even though I interact with this computer and get an Armand NPC, it still spawns the NPC for the other player. And as we will see when I activate Hopkins, Hopkins will only attack me. He's not going to attack Kayak even if I move over to him. I could even attack Kayak if both of us had the player PK on. And also, to note, uh, Hopkins is still here on my screen while it's probably disappeared for him. So, probably that uh, delete NPC kill is not being run somehow. Yeah, it's part of the thread stage, which is only if you interacted with the computer. <laughs> so, the last major thing we'll talk about is colloquially known as getting nulled. Um, this last computer, if I interact with it, nothing happens. Um, on my side of the screen, there is a null NPC, uh, right where I'm standing, but the null NPC is using the green slot. So 
on my screen, Kayak is actually not in this game anymore. But if Kayak moves, Noel moves on my screen. And now if Kayak talks to this computer instead, this opcode will actually overwrite his character data with the NPC information. He will not be able to move, but if he was to quit game, he would overwrite his character with the information and items that this NPC has. Getting nulled was very notorious back in the Dreamcast days. Anytime you have NPC opcodes, this is the thing that you want to completely avoid. This is why we recommend not having NPC opcodes in multiplayer quests. This is why we ensure that the goal is to not overwrite other characters' data. It should be noted on Blueburst that there is no save and quit. So if you overwrite someone's character on Blueburst, it's instant. So the player loses their character instantly because of how Blueburst saves. So if you're working on a quest in Blueburst, you really want to triple and quadruple check to make sure that you are, first of all, checking to make sure that the player loading the quest is in the red slot. And then secondly, make sure you're not spawning any NPCs in said red slot. Once you've uh, confirmed those couple things, then you've pretty much avoided most of the problems that would arise. Now, being that I'm on Dolphin, I can just uh, close the emulation and this won't save for me. But, you know, someone, some unassuming player may not know how that's a, that's what they need to do to avoid getting their character replaced. And with that, that is a non-exhaustive list and function of NPC opcodes. If there are any questions in regards to them, feel free to ask one of us. Feel free to ask in the QEdit Discord. And that's it. Thanks for watching.